So I'm Bernard Fuang. I work at the Open Space Agency, also the International Lunar Exploration Working Group. And I have the pleasure to moderate uh, this session that is uh, proposed by ITACUS, the IEF Committee for the Cultural Utilizations of Space. And so it's my pleasure to uh, greet you, invite you uh, for a launch to new orbits that includes the art. And for this, we have a distinguished uh, um, active panel of artists. So I'm happy to call, to call them. So that's uh, Naum Romero Samora. Please come on stage. So he, he, yes. So he's a director of the Cosmica Institute in Mexico, and is also the current chair of the Itaikus Committee. We have also Melanie King, director of Lumen Studios in the United Kingdom. I told them they can make their entrance uh, with their own style. You know, it's a uh, 3G diversity, so all type of gender, race, generation, and way of walking are welcome. Uh, so you can also do moonwalk. Maybe we we'll try that later, but if you are from another planet, we are very open. So the next one is as you can read, Eva von Linden, from a tall artist, United Kingdom. She was also artist in residence at Estec. And it was a pleasure also to, to see Eva and uh, to share some uh, explosive experience with her, as we'll see later. So um, we have also with us Nelly Ben Ayun. She's the director of NBH Studios but she's also affiliated to the SETI Institute. Uh, the SETI Institute, you know, the Institute for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And I understand we have a, a number of colleagues from SETI, good friends. They cover all areas from uh, research, uh, search for intelligence, and also art. So we have also, yes, that's Nelly. We have also, um, but he's, he's currently still on the moon, on the so-called Republic of the Moon, Rob Lafrenet is a curator, but he's still there on the Republic of the Moon. So he sent us a message. It takes one second for to receive the message, but uh, we try to decode it still. So we try to also show you a video from Rob. And so um, we are going to, to start, and uh, uh, I will ask also, uh, so each of uh, the, the panel speakers also to describe what they do. And uh, we will, uh, so we will uh, give them a few minutes uh, each to uh, also illustrate what they do and what they propose for you in the frame of the social, social uh, cultural utilization of space. And uh, after, we will also have opportunities for you to ask questions so to them individually or them collectively. So I'm going to join them on their art uh, space-time capsule, which is there. That was the fast travel, so I'm arriving now. So we are floating in space. And now I will, uh, so actually we, okay, we are going to start with uh, Nelly. Uh, yes, you, you do. Oh, bonjour, so that's your talk. Yeah, okay. you, you do it from you, you can. So where do you want me? Here, there, up, you, maybe up yeah, is always standard, a bit, standard. yes. Let's, uh, let's do it like that. Oh, yeah. So bonjour, everyone. I mean, you know, I guess <clears throat> I, was, I was hoping for more people to join us because I think it's extremely important, especially if you work in a space agency, to understand the importance of culture uh, as a part of your, you know, of what you do. But you should uh, worry, huh? This is, will. this is webcast to the whole world, to the whole solar system, the whole galaxy ah, is see. receiving your message. <laughs> I see, I see. But then call your friends as well to come and join and see the presentation of my colleagues as well here. Anyway, bonjour everyone. I'm sorry for my extremely strong French accent. There is nothing I can do about it. I've been living in the UK for 12 years, but still living up and strong, you know, it's like good wine. Uh, so anyway, I specialize in something that is called the design of experiences. What does that mean? It means basically pretty much very pluridisciplinary. You know, it means film, science, music, uh, design, 
politics, linguistics, all in one to actually give members of the public an experience that they wouldn't be able to experience otherwise. Uh, and so I do all of this work as part of a studio, uh, which you know is based in the UK. Uh, this is my team, which, as you can see, is also very pre-national. You know, we have a photographer from Colombia. We have our head of music, who is coming from Philippines. Uh, you know, our architect in the team is actually coming from Spain. Will is coming from Australia and so forth. And we are all, you know, very much specialized in completely different uh, topics, completely different theme. And of course, when it comes to designing experience, you need to be very much pluridisciplinary as well in your approach to things. You need to be able to understand science, and you also need to be able to actually like give an experience that is as truthful as possible to members of the public. So looking at music, film design, and so forth. So this is a kind of project that we will do: generating dark energy in your kitchen sink, making volcano in your living room, working with uh, ESA. Or to work on, you know, uh, developing a Soyuz chair that give you the full experience of a rocket liftoff while you're inside your living room, uh, so forth, getting you to experience a sonic boom while you're inside your living room, uh, you know, working with nightclub and so forth to get you to experience politics as well. We work also uh, in the context of politics and so forth. Uh, you will find us pretty much everywhere as well in expeditions. I train people at FEMA, uh, which is, you know, the disaster management team in the U.S., uh, and so we, of course, work a lot with experts. We work very closely with scientists because the point is if you want to give members of the public an experience that is as truthful as possible, then, you know, I never went inside a rocket liftoff. I mean, I nearly died in a rocket capsule uh, in Baikonur Cosmodrome, but that's nowhere close to, you know, being inside a rocket. Uh, and so therefore, I need to work with the astronauts that actually know about it. So when we develop the Soyuz chair, we work with the astronaut Jean-Pierre Nure. You know, when we work on the dark energy, developing dark energy in your kitchen sink, we work with CERN uh, and the scientists there at the Large Long Collider. Uh, and so that means pluridisciplinary team and so forth. So uh, that, in a nutshell, is a design of experience, and um, I mean, we, I guess we will be able to speak about it a bit more during the panel, but this is very much rotating around different disciplines known as critical design, theatrical practices, and performance of politics. Uh, and if you don't know about critical design, this is a new field in design. Uh, you know, you probably think about design in terms of chair or table and so forth, uh, but, you know, since 1999, so it's not completely new, huh? uh, we have a new range of uh, uh, designers that find themselves into very, you know, I would say in quite high places in leadership within the context of technology and, you know, in the Silicon Valley a lot. And they kind of find themselves to question why we are developing new technology. What does it mean to develop, you know, synthetic biology, for example? What does that mean for members of the audience, uh, for example? And um, so the A list is usually the way that you think about design more as a problem-solving approach. Of course, in critical design, we are much more into a problem-finding approach. So questioning the reasoning behind a new technology. What does it mean for members of the public? and so forth. So all of this questioning, all of these ideas, um, I developed basically since 2012 at the SETI Institute, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute. We also have a, a session, the SETI Institute has got a session, uh, I think it's tomorrow, an, a GNF session. Uh, and my role at the SETI is really to think about what is above and what is below and to try and develop projects that will connect these two scales for members of the public. So they understand that whatever happened minus 11 kilometers underwater is also related with what happened, you know, above uh, the sky and beyond. So I will work closely, and I also, you know, with my colleague, uh, I'm a part of different committees at the Astronautical uh, Federation. Uh, and so, you know, we've been developing a lot of projects. Also at NASA, I've been working a lot with uh, Ames Research Center. This is the International Space Orchestra, which is an orchestra that reenacts the drama of uh, space control. These people have been performing at the Hollywood Bowl, big scale, you know, stage, which also allow the scientists to discuss what they do. Uh, as rock stars, pretty much. Uh, and then other films that I've done on NEO, so near Earth object uh, that you know, I've been developing the past. I'm not going to speak for too long, but most recently I just finished a new film called I'm Not a Monster, which is looking at the origin of knowledge, uh, but also looking at, you know, what does it mean to share knowledge with possible, you know, other civilization, and that will be coming out next year. But anyway, so these are different films that we developed at the SETI Institute, and I'm going to stop here.
with a bit of city institute and that's it. Excellent. So bravo, uh, Nelly. So I think a space orchestra, we need an IEF space orchestra. So uh, we need an anthem. So I think we are going to challenge you. So let's uh, please uh, get along. Uh, we, we have to find a way to play uh, cosmic music at IEF. So that leads uh, me to the next uh, speaker. That's uh, Melanie King. She's director of uh, Lumen Studios in the UK. And uh, yes, and we go back. Uh, we are bridging space and society, but that's for the next, uh, yeah, <laughs> the next panel. Yeah, Melanie. Hello. So I'm an artist and curator, and I'm uh, studying at the Royal College of Art. Um, today, I just wanted to show you quickly some of the um, collectives that I curate. So this is Lumen, and we're a collective which is designed to raise a dialogue about how humanity understands existence in relation to astronomy. So we do this through things like telescope sessions, where people can look through a telescope and um, take a photograph of the moon and then print it using Polaroid film. Um, we do really large-scale installations. Um, so this is from the Lumen School of Light exhibition, Ugly Duck, which was a three-story exhibition, um, all to do with light and our relationship to astronomy. Uh, we do really large installations and commissions. So this was an eclipse commission that we had at the time of the solar eclipse in 2017. We run a residency to Italy um, every year, and we take 20 artists over the period of about two weeks to visit observatories. So we go to Campo Catino Observatory in Italy, and also Emiliano Cardone Observatory, and then the artists respond to that transformative experience over that time. So these are the studios, and then we have an exhibition, publication, and film, which is debuted in London a couple of months afterwards. Um, and I'm also the co-director of Super Collider. Uh, so we bring art and science to where it usually isn't, so places like hotels and uh, museums and art galleries. Uh, we do publications, so this was a book that was covering about 10 years of Super Collider experience. Um, this was a commission which was about the science of sleep, and we do field trips again to go and see things like um, observatories and to explore forests and think about wonderful nature. Uh, and then I also am going to present some of my research tomorrow, which is about this idea of ancient light. So the idea of light traveling for thousands, if not millions of years before affecting photosensitive film. So here's some examples of that. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Oh, you have beautiful sky in the UK. I wish I had the same in Holland. <laughs> and uh, that's why I built space observatories and we don't depend on weather. Beautiful. Yeah, so we are going uh, to continue with this uh, uh, short presentation of, um, from some of our speakers. So the next one is uh, Naum, Naum Romero Samora. He's the director of the Cosmic Institutes and is also the current chair of the Itacus uh, uh, IF committee. Naum. Great. Um, let's bring on the slides. And as that happened, uh, tomorrow I would like to invite you to the contemporary art and space uh, session, which is at what time? Do you remember? The space, yeah. Uh, as part of the space culture. Okay. Yeah, well, check out the, the, the technical sessions. There, there, there's one that is chaired by Nelly, uh, with space culture. space culture, and there's one about contemporary art. And what I want to talk about today is about something that is a little bit critical. And uh, often artists uh, that are engaged in science, and in this particular case, space activities, uh, people often think that we illustrate, that we communicate uh, uh, science and space research. But I see another big advantage of being an artist working in this field, and that is being able to formulate 
and to ask some of the uh, tricky questions that, that inform space activities, but also that inform some of our issues that we have on our planet. Next one, please. So I'm going to start with this letter. Uh, OK. I'm going to start with this letter. Uh, most of you might know this series of letters issued in the 60s. It says, Dear Miss Kelly, this is in response to your letter of February 20th, 1962. Your offer to go on a space mission is commendable, and we're very grateful. Uh, however, this is to advise uh, that we have no existing program concerning women astronauts, nor do we contemplate any such plans. We appreciate your interest and support of the nation's space program. Obilo, Director of Public Information of uh, NASA. Next one, please. I can carry on, but these letters, they send the same message. Your willingness to serve your country as a volunteer woman astronaut is commendable, again. However, while many, many women are employed in other capacities in the space program, some of them in extremely important scientific posts, we have no present plans to employ women on space flights because, there's a reason, of the degree of scientific and flight training and the physical characteristics which are required. We appreciate your interest. Of course, to th today things have changed, and we still have 10% a, a of astronautic crews that are women, but 10% is a number far away from having a big celebration. Next one, please. So what if we could change history? What if we could have more people on the moon? in the past? What if that experience of walking on the dunes and surface of that celestial body was open for more people? Often art, as you know it, is external and material, but also let's, let's challenge that assumption. What if it's something that is internal and immaterial, ethereal? Next. So I started to perform this uh, series of performances that I've been doing for the last four or five years, where I invite an audience in theaters around the world. I hypnotize them. And once they're in a trance state, I put, I implant a false memory in their, in their minds, a Do memory about walking on the moon. Do you still, you already feel it? I start to feel huh, the... Do you feel it? I'm uh, getting hypnotized. <laughs> <laughs> we can try that. <laughs> yeah. So, so this experience is, is open to anyone, to no matter race, gender, sexual orientation. And after an hour of feeding this, this memory, they wake up and they remember experiencing an earth rise and walking on the moon and being part of of this uh, human uh, journey out of this planet. Next one, please. I'm gonna read some quotes. I had to leave this world to come to the conclusion that borders are human-made concept. Jose Hernandez, Mexican-American astronaut. In the orbital perspective, you see the world as a whole. You don't see borders from space, Rongaran, astronaut. In space, you recognize the un unanimity of our existence, Chris Hadfield, astronaut, and so on. Uh, quotes like this are common after space flights. Astronauts come back with a very different vision of our planet that makes us rethink how we see a map and how we understand those divided maps and colored countries that we see in every classroom around the world. Next. So with these ideas, we started uh, the Cosmica Institute, an institute that explores all the cultural, poetic, and cultural perspectives of our space activities, but also how these activities have an impact on our planet and on our culture. Next. 
And we've been working with people in the humanities, in the arts, with people in the space sector, but also with the, the broader society, how space can actually give a hand to people that most need it on these times. Um, since last year, we started working with uh, immigrants in the Mexican-American border and with refugees across Europe to, to create this program called Cosmica Journeys. Uh, these people suffer the most from borders and these artificial lines that we have created along our history. So what if these groups that are confined, that that are, in, that are flying away of war, uh, economic struggles, social oppression, how can they benefit from the overview effect, from this view of a unified planet? So during one month, we go with these groups, and they have to develop a space mission, a space mission where they go out of Earth conceptually, but the mission is to look around and look at Earth and see it as the home of all. Uh, so they have to design uh, earth flags, they have, to, they have to write stories, they have to uh, rethink the relationship to our planet. And the message is pretty simple. No matter where they are, no matter how difficult their struggle is, they belong to this planet. Next one. Also, <clears throat> with Cosmica, we've been working a lot on, the, on a term that we often hear everywhere, and that is colonizing Mars, having a colony on the moon. And let's remember that we have colonized great part of our planet, the Americas, Africa, Asia. Those regions have been colonized. It's a framework, it's a paradigm that we have used, we have explored, uh, we have abused it, and it has brought great trauma to many parts of the world. So we ask this question. We might not have the solution, but we can ask from the humanities, do we really want to export that paradigm out of our planet? Or, of course, it not might be the way that it will happen on Mars, but maybe it's just a reflection of our mental imperial uh, mental structures. So space is a great opportunity for rethinking about what is in our minds, but also how we want to portray humanity beyond our planet. Next one. But also, my work is about connection. Next. Um, let's, uh, as an artist, I put together uh, space missions, and this was the first uh, space mission I did with, uh, with uh, the Yuri Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City, Russia. And the moment we were floating, a series of nine artists, we were suspended for the first time, and we felt that every single cell of our bodies was weightless. And in that situation, uh, we lost our materiality, and our bodies were pretty much the same as the void, as nothing. We lost sense of ourselves. But when we reached out to the other and embraced another person, then we realized that we can only exist if we are together. So that's my message today. Thank you. OK, thank you, Naum. Thank you. OK, so a great uh, a set of uh, inspiration, also very deep philosophical part of it. And so we'll continue now with Eve van Linden. Uh, actually, so she's an artist, and she has been artist in residence at Estec, so we had a very good opportunity. I've learned also practicing art with Eve. Eve.
So that was an excerpt from the performance that was created as part of the residency at the European Space Agency. And something to let you know about this performance was very similar to how you were sitting here in the dark. That's how I started the performance. All the people who came to watch the performance were put on a bus, they were taken to a warehouse in the middle of the city, they didn't know where they were. They were walked into uh, the space, it was dark, they were given a mask, some protective goggles, they were given various bits of equipment and they were just asked to stand in the space for quite some time, not really knowing what was gonna happen. Eventually, we motion for them silently to sit down and they sit again in the dark waiting. They sit long enough to forget why they're there, to start to accept, stop asking questions, to become really in tune with the space and a bit more mindful of their own presence. And eventually, bang, it all starts. Now we'd start to take them on a journey which doesn't just involve the spectacular, it involves moment of quiet, moments of contemplation, and then also these big um, shocks and huge explosions that really allow people to feel the heat on their face and the kind of excitement and awe that people think about when they think about space. The whole performance was inspired by um, the processes of the stars, which is a particular fascination for me, and that's what I based my research around at ESA. It doesn't reflect exactly, it's not an educational thing, it's more experiential. So it's about people feeling the emotions and the reactions to their own inquisitive minds and, and hearts. So, what's the last one? One second, I'm just gathering my thoughts. <laughs> I might have to check my notes. So the chaos really is quite an important factor in my work. Um, the process of making, creative process is often quite a, a chaotic one and something that's quite familiar with many creative people. Uh, we have a lot of open-ended experiments and especially with explosives, I don't really always know what's going to happen and I have to be comfortable with that. I have to be comfortable with thinking something that is unexpected and might not be what I planned is about to happen. Um, and I think this is really important. It's something um, that a lot of scientists are not comfortable with. Their uh, inquisitiveness and their openness about discovering the unknown um, turns into a process of very um, linear and very ordered uh, structure. So my perspective today is really about um, how to feel comfortable with chaos. And I've recently been um, designing a program which is made specially for the space industry to allow them to feel comfortable within a space of chaos. As we talk, as some of the other panelists have mentioned, you know, we're looking into a new time where people are going to be um, potentially living on the moon and Mars. It's becoming not a question of if, but maybe of when. So we look, ask this question about culture and how we're creating new cultures. The space industry, for the most part, tends to see themselves as um, conducting science, making everything happen, and their cultural remits are very much about educating people on Earth about science, or um, bringing Earth culture to space. They don't see themselves so much as culture creators or exploring what culture can be on in space. And this is where all the work of the artists come in, where their experiments are really important. But understanding the value of that and creating that shift into culture creators is a really important one, and I think um, it will be really interesting to allow the space industry to become comfortable with open-ended experiments, 
with allowing artists to have freedom or citizens and other people in space to have freedom to create culture uh, in a conscious way and not just um, assume that it's going to evolve on its own. It's actually something that needs to be nurtured. The word culture itself comes from culturing the ground and it implies the need to be um, worked on and developed and uh, consciously attained. I think that's it for now. I kept it very, okay. very short and sweet. Well, thanks, so, Eva. <laughs> thank I mean, you. this stellar explosion, that brings some hypnotic memories in my mind from the time I was stardust. I remember, you know, when this star exploded, that was part of us. <laughs> Amazing. So we I think stardust. we have to, <laughs> we are stardust. Big Bang children as well. Yeah, so, um, as you know, the, uh, thank you. Okay, let's uh, applaud all our moderators, our speakers. So, the ETACUS Committee of, on Social Cultural Utilization of Space has a number of organizations, space agencies, also so societies, uh, or artistic uh, uh, organizations that are supporting some of its cause. One of them is the International Lunar Exploration Working Group. So I'm going to make a kind of summary of uh, some uh, artistic and cultural events that Ilwig has done, actually with a number of you. I can uh, see that uh, we have been partnering. Uh, we have also some, uh, uh, some uh, colleagues that uh, came. So uh, you will recognize, can you uh, pass my presentation? So we have a German with us, uh, Yvette, Benjamin, Jamy. So also uh, I've seen Sarah Jane, I've seen uh, also uh, Steve. Uh, so a number of colleagues which have contributed actually to the display of what we are going to present. Yes, so actually we started uh, like more than 10 years ago uh, to create a Moon Academy. And this organized a workshop. This was this with artist Alicia Fremis. So we had a, a group of artists, designers, even fashion designers that came to us at Estec and we went also to the city to design uh, um, lunar base or, or lunar fashion, 3D printing, all type of activities. We even opened a shop on the moon, Moon Concept Store. And uh, so we put it uh, in the center of Amsterdam for three months. We have also at this occasion met a number of artists like Evelina Dominic and uh, Dimitri Gelfand, with whom we started a class of art science in the uh, interfaculty in The Hague. So this is this young artist at work, 20 of them per year, and they developed some uh, artwork or performances inspired by space. Uh, so they visited our STEC center, and then they developed some projects. You can see, for instance, uh, here, this is uh, uh, Marit. She developed a, pro a project to put slime mold on the moon. Another group developed uh, some um, simulation of uh, uh, vortice vortices and the atmosphere in giant planets. Um, others like, um, developed a lunar freedom. It's a robotic village. Always this was uh, more than uh, yes, uh, five years ago. He built a village with humans and robots. Unfortunately, a meteorite hit the dome and the human died, but the robotic village continued to work forever and ever with a beautiful uh, installation of light and sound. We had also an artist in residence some 10 years ago, Ayako Ono. She worked with us on the concept of Lunar Zen Garden. We had the landers, we had rovers, and our idea was, okay, I want to use those rovers to draw a Zen garden on the moon. And so she uh, was with our robotic group and tested this idea in our moon Mars yard. More recently, I had uh, also a student. She's uh, an archivist, and she developed how we could proceed to build an Alexandria library on the moon. So we looked how do we collect some of the input from all the cultures, uh, from all generations, and, and it was also a work where we looked with engineers how we could, what would be the technical solution to install this library on the moon in case we would uh, lose our uh, species or civilization on Earth. So that's an example of some of the, yes, uh, the session we had with art science in, uh, in The Hague. We had also sessions where, in addition to artists, we worked with uh, biologists or, or physicists 
And this is a, a, a workshop we organized how to print biomaterial. And uh, so we do that at STEC, but also at uh, Free University Amsterdam. So we are, are organizing every year a series of workshops uh, where we merge artists and scientists and engineers. So this is for instance, a workshop we organize at STEC. We, we have some lenders, we have some telescope, we have a, a plant growth in, uh, experiment, and we look also how we could put some artistic experiment on future mission to the moon. So one of them is a moon gallery. A moon gallery for science, art, and seeds. That's an idea that I proposed like some 10 years ago uh, to the community, but more recently with the help of uh, um, Alexander Zaklinski and Anna Sindnikova, we are making a very proactive effort to invite the community to uh, provide content for a gallery that we'll put on the moon. It will be a gallery of 100 pieces of art, agreed 10 by 10. But because I have to pay $1 million per kilo, we have miniaturized it in a 10 by 10 centimeter. So we are calling all of you. You could propose an artwork, and we'll have to miniaturize it into one centimeter. And we, will, we are doing some, a series of exhibitions all over the Earth. Uh, we'll do some in Aztec in November. We'll do some in, in a glacier in Switzerland. We'll put them in all continents. And then after, we'll put it on our eight continents, which is the moon. So we have also organized activities. This is a, an art science student. He developed a virtual uh, uh, game, as you would be on the moon, here together with Maria, uh, Maria Grulich, one of our young math colleagues. We had a, a number of activities with art science, the egg. The last one was called Space is a Place. We worked also with the Applied Art Academy in Rotterdam, Willem de Koning. Uh, so these are people very good with hands with textile, with material, with wood, with everything. And so they, they developed a project called King of the Moon. Yeah, they are monarchies in Holland, or King of Mars, and where they developed artwork. And so these are some of their work presented here to some uh, other uh, uh, scientists and other artists. Now we uh, like to organize events in space, so we bring the artists to our space place. So these are artists from the, uh, the, the Hague, uh, conservatory, the, the orchestra, so various artists coming. We bring them to the moon, we bring them on the Columbus module, we put them inside where they can experience zoology for a few moments. At least. So we also had uh, organized some events where every planetary session should include an art and musical event. So, so we invite artists to, uh, to present yeah, their way, so with uh, interactive painting, with uh, music, uh, uh, with beer, as, as we have seen, it's a very important ingredient of uh, what uh, the space generation wants. So another event at Two Days Art, the largest electronic art festival in, uh, in uh, Holland, that was in The Hague. Um, we bring our lander to the center of the city, so these are some of our astronauts with our lander. We also, as we have seen, as uh, Melanie has uh, shown, we watch the sky, we watch the moon, we share it with the public, uh, we also sometimes put our, take our instrument, not only the scientific instrument, but some of our musical instrument. And this was an event where we built some agora in the city. We debated about space, about art, and we also practice our musical art together. And I would like to finish with one project called Moon Village, and you will hear about it with, uh, um, during the, the session, where we uh, involve 20 countries, uh, school kids, to play, perform a Moon Village story, which is about a young girl which is born in the moon, first baby on the moon. And uh, this was performed uh, uh, and broadcast on TV uh, last year. And so the, with uh, artists and with, uh, uh, with uh, children, we had beautiful costumes. I hope that's an inspiration. We have also with us here some, some great uh, fashion designers that are joining our team, Jamie Landy. And uh, so I hope that we will have uh, so fashion like this on the moon. And uh, so that's uh, how I would like to end. So uh, this presentation from various activities where the International Lunar Exploration Working Group has in fact also served as a platform to support uh, various uh, artistic uh, uh, projects. So now I would like to move and to say, you know, as you see, we have a very good gender balance here. 
because uh, we have uh, three ladies, and we have three men. One of them is on the moon, on the Republic on the moon. So I hope, uh, Rob, do you hear us? Can you send your presentation? Martin, do you have uh, the presentation from Rob? So let's have the presentation from Rob about the Republic of the Moon. And while we have the presentation, I would like to ask you to uh, think of uh, some uh, questions you would like to ask. Maybe uh, you, we can also put a bit of light because now you will be the main actors because uh, the idea is to, yeah, to bridge, to bridge uh, between uh, uh, space and society through arts. And I saw many in the audience are also do doing that. And so prepare some of your questions and your intervention for just after um, Rob's presentation. Thank you. So, Rob. Good morning, everybody, at the Global Networking Forum. I'm Rob Lafrenny, and we're going to talk to you about the Moon and the future history of the Moon. Republic of the Moon, the exhibition that I curated, was started because of a discussion about space law that happened at Ithacus. And a member of the Ithacus panel said, what we don't want is a Republic of the Moon. So I thought that would be a good title for an exhibition. And Lillian Lynn declared the moon to be called She, as you can see here in this artwork, which was the major artwork in the Republic of the Moon. This feminist idea was put forward by Alexandra Mir in her work, The First Woman on the Moon, which no doubt many of you have heard of, where she used diggers to drill out um, a moon landscape on a um, dune beach near Nordvik. She also visited the Kennedy Space Center, and this inspired her to make a rocket that would go nowhere for our exhibition with the Arts Catalyst, Space Soon. This was a giant rocket which we built and lasted for not very long. But also, if you look at these amazing pictures of the lunar and the lunar cod, you will think about the kind of things that are currently sitting on the moon. Those vehicles are still on the moon. And underneath them, um, as you can see, somebody has bought the land and they're now selling uh, Moonland, as we all know. And I think the most interesting thing about the Moon is the fact that we're still measuring the distance between the Moon and the Earth, three centimetres a year. These are the Texas laser ranges. I went to look for them and went and banged on their cabin door when they were sleeping and asked them were they really going to be bouncing signals off the Moon. This is Katie Patterson, um, Moonlight Sonata, where she... Uh, bounce the signals of that music from the moon. These people, these are ideas of how you might live on the moon, how you might establish a republic of the moon. And this is Bruce Gilchrist and Joel Jolson who lived in Antarctica, sensing sunlight. This is Agnes Mayer Brandis testing um, gravity on the earth. Um, and she also is working here with amateur rocketeers. Agnes, many of you probably know Agnes's but, uh, work, but she worked um, about this idea of the man in the moon, the first ever science fiction uh, writer, to try to use moon geese to take her to the moon. And here she is training the moon geese as part of a project, again done by the Arts Catalyst for Republic of the Moon. She incubated the geese, um, caused them to be born, named them after various uh, figures in astronautics and cosmonautics. You were growing us there. And here are all the cosmonauts in all their finery. And here she is training them to go to the moon using a bicycle. And also um, l teaching them to fly and take off and pull her eventually to the moon. These are real geese, and we did a project with these geese, uh, this remote project at Fact in Liverpool as part of the Republic of the Moon, where members of the public could interact with the moon geese. As you can see, this baby is 
pressing some buttons. It was part of this exhibition that then came to London. And also, this is um, the Private Moon Project. Um, as you can see, this Russian artist has got his own private moon and he travels around the world with it. It's his own notion of how the moon is very personal to him. So in a day and age when various people are going to the moon or thinking about going to the moon, we colonise the moon. They're thinking about moon rocks and um, at the point where um, there are now Japanese tourists going to circulate the moon with Elon Musk's SpaceX, beginning to think about the political effects of being on the moon. And this is a demonstration outside of the Republic of the Moon exhibition by We Colonise the Moon. Another demonstration as part of um, the Aerocene project with Thomas Saraceno, Space Without Rockets, the idea that you should could go into space without rockets. And then finally, um, here we have the um, notion that the heritage sites should be saved. Um, and finally, a temple by Jorge uh, Manas Rubio. And finally, Alan Bean, the first artist on the moon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. So we, uh, we salute you from here. And so, um, so now I would like to ask uh, if you have any statement. And uh, I would like also to ask you to join us on the Republic of the Moon. So please come here in the front uh, the stage so that we can document how we have bridged uh, between art and space. So anybody wants to make a statement? Uh, or uh, Do you have a question for our panel? Who wants to join? Ah, yes, please. So there is a microphone. Please identify yourself. Do you want to go to the moon? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, very good. Uh, I'm Marius from France, and I have a question for uh, the, the fireworks exhibition. Yeah, well, uh, in the video, we can see that the, the fireworks uh, explode inside a cube, right? But I want to know uh, why did you choose a cube and not a sphere? Did and you not get a sphere. My okay. Well, so there's a couple of reasons for that. The cute that piece was one of the um, that was born from a couple of ideas. So, one were I was looking at the inherent um, sense of this, the the inbuilt protection that the universe has for us. So our planet has the magnetosphere, which protects us from the solar rays. The so solar system has the helio sphere and the galaxies have a halo. And these all protect us from various layers of radiation that, that, that come from outside of those systems. And I wanted to create a kind of wall, actually, in a space that where I could fire the um, explosives at the audience, but they would be safe behind the wall. So that was one thing. I couldn't do a whole wall for practical reasons. And so I also became inspired by the idea of the black box, which is when scientists are modeling the universe, they have to start with a black box. They call it the black box. And I, that's so ironic because you're already putting the concept of the universe in a three-dimensional box when you're trying to explore uh, you know, ideas beyond three dimensions. So I found that quite interesting and kind of combined the two ideas together to create this... Um, universe in a box that but you were safe from so that's where that piece okay. came from thank, thank you. you very much um we will have to close soon the panel but i would like first you know you are friends of the art we have a special meeting committee meeting of itacus at 11 o'clock in room ovb ovb uh, so e -V -B. so you are all invited to join as friends of uh, of the art and itacus and um, after the question, I will ask each of you to prepare like a 30 second clip. What do we do next from your individual perspective? Okay, so question, can you identify yourself? Hmm? I, uh, sorry, I just want to read my question. My name is Tendama Dima, I'm from South Africa. I just want to ask one or two questions. I think there are five, if you give me a chance. I see you are investing so, much in infrastructure and it does look like you are investing because you know the end result 
I want to know whether, secondly, the robotic village that you are mentioning will have an impact on how we interpret the robots to be going to be contributing to whatever you are doing. Because the only robot I trust so far is the street robot. I do not know much about the ones that you are talking about. Thirdly, in terms of the indigenous knowledge system, what culture are you deriving? Are you getting all continents' cultures in terms of how they should respond to what you are doing? Or are you particularly looking at one side? The fourth one is uh, in terms of colonizing Mars and Moon. There seem to be a shift from uh, Mars. I've asked this question before somewhere. And I'm not too sure whether there is some doubt on whether Mars will be realized as a destination. And the last one is in terms of copyright issues and uh, protection of performance. How do you protect yourself when you are exposing yourself in so much performances in preparation of uh, whatever you are trying to do? Thank you. OK, so I'm going to start with Robotic Village and uh, uh, all continents, but some of you will have to address uh, colonization of the Mars. I can take number three as well. Yeah, OK, excellent. So yes, Robotic Village, clearly now we are in a in time in our history where robots are taking more and more role. And uh, so it's also it's our way as well, having a robot on the moon, to uh, get all humanity to be involved. Uh, so we, we, the robot can be an envoy. Like I was working, I, I sent myself my baby around the moon. He was a robot. It, it orbited the moon for one year and a half, and we could pilot, and we got images that we shared with the whole world. And so I said, it's a new paradigm where these robots are also part of humanity as a way to, to achieve some of our goal, which is uh, education, inspiration, uh, uh, innovation, knowledge, also to address some of the big goals of today, like the sustainable development goals. So I think that robots have their place. And it's true that we, we work local, we work national, regional, but global as well. So we have to explore all this part. And so everybody has, must have to find a way locally to contribute also to the global uh, goals. And it's true that we have some means that are sometimes more uh, national or re regional, but we have to serve the global issue. What about uh, number three? So number three, the question about culture is a very good question. And um, you know, the theme of the IAF this year is involve everyone. But I think as you can see from the demographic of the whole event, there is not everyone represented. And that's partly because of the way that the evolution of the space industry has evolved, you know, how it's evolved. But um, if they want to have that goal, they need to start to understand culture a lot better. And that needs to mean they need to reach out to people who understand it better. Um, they can't do it on their own. And that means not just about, uh, it's, it's all very well talking about uh, gender and diversity and, and ge geography. But they need to invite people from those spaces to talk, even if they don't have um, space agencies. And as everybody talks about um, the Outer Space Treaty, the benefit of all mankind, what is the benefit of all mankind? And uh, who, which mankind and how, who, dis who makes those decisions? The Outer Space Treaty itself is equally revered and laughed at for this very reason. And the changing uh, evolution of what is good, for example, um, outer space, is there's meant to be no sovereignty in space. Now, you can understand where that came from because that treaty was written after a period of war, so at, where sovereignty was deemed to be the, the cause of that. So saying there's no sovereignty is kind of saying that's a way of trying to prevent those battles between pe sovereign states. However, battles can happen in other ways, uh, through commercial or other entities. So how, um, you know, these, these are all very good questions. So how, how, how do we represent countries that aren't in the space industry? Um, so yeah, I mean, this is a very open-ended question. And I think it's something that people need to, this is where Iticus actually is gonna come into its own, I think, in the next uh, few years, where people need to start asking the experts from, from the cultural, um, all over the world, so Iticus needs to grow and invite more people from all over the world, and it yes. needs to become this place to be. In the case, IAF of the whole is very attached to this uh, uh, principle of 3G, so expand in geography, gender equality, and also intergenerations. 
So we have to play a role there. We have to wrap up. So you have uh, now the 30 second uh, uh, chance, each of you, to, to wrap up what you see, what is your perspective. Uh, let's start with uh, Nelly. What do I see? Well, I guess, uh, is this working? Yeah. yeah, well, I guess uh, to go back to your point, I think, you know, the key is going to be, I mean, for us, at least in the creative sector, to try and, you know, modify some of the parameters of success, I guess, inside space agency when you come to outreach and communication. I think too often uh, it's being said that, you know, a project or, you know, is of interest to the public depending on how many of them actually watch or, you know, have participated to an event without actually considering, you know, the long-term impact that culture can have uh, in terms of communication with, uh, you know, with audience members. So for me, it really is about trying to modify these metrics long-term and also include uh, that question that you, you, you put forward there, which is, you know, how do you actually go beyond this kind of like quite uh, colonialistic, uh, you know, visions of uh, what space is and what space should be in a way. So to include more conversation around this topic of race, gender, and so forth. I think the next steps is reaching out again to different kinds of cultural organizations to get involved because um, you can see within the bubble that they're only advertising within their bubble. So if the space industry is reaching out to, um, it's also access, you know, they might promote something, but if people aren't aware or at part of the sector in which that's promoted, they're never going to know about it. So this is really important, I think, in the next step. I was exactly thinking the same thing. I think a lot of the time um, people are preaching to the converted about the space and about space and culture. And for me, it's really interesting to consider how to reach those people that might not think about space and how we might reach those kind of communities. Okay. Uh, three things. One is um, let's reflect on our past and the things that we have done on our planet and to our planet uh, and learn from these mistakes. Now, in the present, I'm going to quote uh, Sarah Jane Pell, who is here. Uh, I think every, uh, every space mission needs an artist. It's, it's quite urgent. And third, to, to dream more. I, I, have, I have a problem accepting that the most visionary people that we have in the industry they have as an ultimate goal going to to Mars. I think we have to we have to go beyond. Uh, let's remember the cosmists. They had ridiculous ideas, but thanks to the, those ideas, we were able to develop astronautics. So let's let's go for it and let's think for the impossible. Okay. So develop creativity. So bring the you know, the okay diversity. Uh, so, dream more, uh, find new, more responsible scheme, how we interact, explore space, and also bridge, involve everyone. So, this was the theme of IF. Uh, so, we have to close now, but I would like to invite you all, friends of Stacus, please come in front of stage, because we want also to uh, document uh, our friendship of uh, uh, being friend of space and art, and I want also again to invite you to our Itacus meeting in room OVB6 at uh, 11 o'clock. I want to thank uh, Martin as well, uh, so our helper, uh, all the technical uh, team, and, and also the GNF, and, uh, the GNF uh, 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 team, and also Rob from the Moon. Thank you very much for your help.